many of you read chapter 4 for your homework last week? I had, I feel the Holy Ghost coming on. You ran? You, you read chapter 4? You read? Quite a bit of it? God bless you, Jeanette. Three cheers for Jeanette. Yay, Jeanette. Yay, Jeanette. Yay, Jeanette. <laughs> Praise God. Well, your homework this week is to read chapter 4. I mean, come on. You've got to read chapter 4. You know, you can sit in certain places where you're tied up for a few minutes, and you can read it. You know, when you're doing different things, you can read it. You gotta have time. Amen? All right, we're gonna get into chapter five tonight. We're gonna talk about foundations of interpretation. How many enjoying the class so far? You enjoying it? Okay, getting some stuff out of it, learning how to interpret the Bible. That's part of Bible study. It's not always studying per se the Bible verses, but it's understanding on how to interpret the Bible. Because we have so many people out there that are interpreting the Bible in so many different ways. And uh, they say, well, everybody's interpretation is right. Can't be. It's impossible. And so um, we, um, we need to teach that and we need to practice that. Not many people do. Many people are lazy. They don't want to learn. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to sit and study. But that's what God's Word says to do. Amen? We'll learn about all kinds of things, bugs and trees and all kinds of stuff, and, but we don't want to learn about God's Word. Come on. God's Word is the most... I'm, I'm not even getting an amen here. I'm going to go sit down in a minute. You know, God's Word is the most important. We know all the news, everything that's on Facebook, man. We know who's saying what, what's saying who, and what's standing up, and what's sitting down, what's not kneeling, who's kneeling. Who, what team did this, what team did that? But what about the Bible? Come on, somebody, give me a good amen. Come on, we've got we to gotta put our priorities in, in right order, right? We've got to study the Bible. I've been studying the Bible for years. You've got to study the Bible. If you want to really know who God is, you've got to study the Bible. You want to be encouraged during the times of discouragement? You've got to know the Bible. Because it's the Scriptures that will encourage you. It's the Scriptures that the Holy Ghost will bring to your remembrance. And as you do that, God will begin to speak to you. And He'll be able to encourage you and lift you up. Amen? So tonight we're going to talk about Foundations of Interpretation, Chapter 5. And the goal here in hermeneutics is to properly determine what God has said in Are we back? Yeah, we're back. As I said, the goal of hermeneutics is to properly determine what God has said in the Scriptures and to determine the meaning of the Word of God. That's where it came from. It came from Ezra. We talked about that, how he was the first one to interpret and begin to explain the Bible to people. But from the time that the Bible was written until now, there's what's called different... Um, aspects of it where we have different uh, problems that we come up with. One of them is a linguistic gap. In other words, the Bible was written in three different languages. Who knows what those languages were? Yep, Hebrew, Greek, and Arabic. Good. Uh, and uh, the Greek was Koine Greek, which is no longer spoken anymore. So 
a lot of times, some of the words, you've got to go back and you've got to research those words to really truly understand what the meaning was. You have to sometimes go back and learn about the culture. You have to learn about different things in the Bible that was spoken about, like cisterns and things like that, and find out what was the meaning of that. What, what did it mean, uh, some of the things? And we talked about that with the shepherd hearing his voice. And what, how, did that be, how was that interpreted when Jesus said those things, my sheep know my voice? He wasn't, he wasn't, it's a metaphor. He wasn't saying his people were little sheep. He didn't have literal sheep following him. But he was using that as a metaphorical expression so that you and I can understand. But what was the context behind that? What was, what, how did, what, when, when he spoke that to the Jews, what did they have in their mind? And we talked about, I'll just kind of, re, kind of go over that just a little bit because that's kind of a linguistic type thing. So when you see, when Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. How did the Jews interpret that? What did they know about that? Well, how it goes is like this. That sometimes you'd have two or three shepherds. They were all together and all the flocks were together. And when one of the shepherds decided it was time to leave, he would say some certain words. Like, Kulatapa, something like that. And as soon as his voice went out, his sheep would raise their head and he would begin to walk off in a distance, and the sheep would leave all of the other sheep that are there, and his sheep would follow him. And what he was trying to tell his disciples was is that my sheep hear my voice means they are obedient to me. Without question. Those sheep don't question. Those don't sheep say, hey, is that, the, is that the shepherd? Is that my shepherd? I wonder if it's my shepherd. Could it be my shepherd? Well, I'm not sure of the voice. Maybe Let's hear it one more time. No. When the shepherd spoke, the sheep automatically instantly obeyed the voice. And that's the thing that the ancient Israelites, when they heard that, when he gave that analogy of my sheep hear my voice, that's what they equated that to, was instant obedience. My sheep hear my voice. In other words, they obey immediately. So those are the kind of things you need to look up and you need to study that to get the full meaning. Okay, so one of the things that is a linguistic gap here is, is the vocabulary. And sometimes there's what's called etymological studies of words and attempting to understand words by examining the origin of those words. You have to understand that sometimes when, when the Bible speaks in English, the word back then is a totally different meaning than what it is today. And one of the examples I gave you, it says, wives, right? Uh, be submissive to your husbands, and you will win them by your chaste conversation. Well, again, in the old English, conversation doesn't mean dialogue and talking. So when you go back and you read this and you understand the, the original con, uh, intent of that word, it means by your lifestyle, how you live, not by so much what you say. So a lot of people, though, believe that. Some people say, oh, no, that's the conversation. That's when they're talking. You, you know, wife's talking to the husband. No, I said, that's not what it means. So you have to go back and you have to sometimes learn those things. Now, can we get the basic Bible teaching from the word just by English? Yes. But if you want to get into a, a, a greater knowledge of God and how he works and everything, you've got to study the word. Amen? Then there's what's called comparative study of a word, where you're attempting to understand a word by studying all of its occurrences in Scripture. You have to remember that sometimes when something is mentioned, next chapter we're going to get into the principle of first mention. But when, we, when you see a, a word, sometimes the word body will say, okay? It can, it can be a body, a physical body. It can be a body of water. It can be Christ is the head of the body. It can be the church. So it's different meaning. So you, just because you read it somewhere in one particular place doesn't mean that it's the same meaning all the time through the scripture. You've got to look at the context. And we've always talked about that. Then there's the cultural study. You have to understand that sometimes in the Bible, and a lot of people run into difficulties and problems with this. They'll read Matthew 24 and they'll say, where it says, even the very elect can be deceived. Okay? And they say, see, even the church can be deceived. And I said, well, what makes you think the elect is this, in this particular context is the church? Well, he's talking to us, isn't he? Well, well, let's examine that first. You cannot change the original intent of the letter. Who was the letter written to first? Come on, speak it. Huh? The Jews, right? If you look at Matthew, it's the genealogy of, of, of Christ. And it's all the Jewish history. It goes all the way up to Christ, proving that he has the right as king of kings and lord of lords to sit on the throne of David because he's of his genealogy. 
And then it goes on and starts talking to the Jews. Now, we get principles and truths, and we can apply those truths throughout, but you cannot ignore the original intent of the letter. And that's where people fall into error, and that's where they begin to put in false doctrine, and that's why they come up with their own doctrines and their own teachings, and they get away from the Word of God. The very elect there he's talking to is the Jews. If you look at chapter 24, it's talking about the end times. It's talking about the tribulation period. The church isn't going to be here. Okay, so when you look at that, and he says, when you see these things, you know, the very elect will be deceived, meaning that the Jews are going to be deceived when the Antichrist comes into power. They're going to think that he's the Messiah. Jesus said, there's one, me you will not receive, Jesus said, but there's one coming after me whom you will receive. Okay, and that's the Antichrist. So that's, so the Jews are going to be deceived until, until, the, the abomination of desolation takes place, which, which is spoken of by Daniel. Okay, when the Antichrist goes into the temple, the temple that's going to be built, and he sits on the throne and says that he's God. Then their eyes are going to be opened. Okay, so you have to understand that Scripture always, he's not bothering me, he's not bothering me, um, it's always got to be in context to the intent of the original letter of who it was spoken to. You can't take away from that. If I write a letter to Debbie, okay, and I'm, my letter is directed at Debbie, and then 100, 200 years from now you read that letter, you can't say, oh, oh, that part is for me. No, originally intended was for her. Now, there might be principles that you can take or maybe lessons you can learn from those things, but you cannot do away with that letter was to Debbie. My letter was to Debbie. It's the same way with the scriptures. Those letters were written to certain individuals and certain churches, and you have to understand them in their cultural and their uh, uh, context. Then is it, it's, it's also the study of the words in the cognate language, attempting to understand a word by investigating its equivalent in, in related languages. So like the Hebrew and the Greek, you've got to understand what that word means because sometimes it means a little bit different. You have, to, you have to kind of do a comparison. And I'm not talking about you have to be a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar. You have lexicons. You have uh, Strong's concordances. You have Bind's expository dictionaries. You have all of these helps that are available that these men gave their lives to produce these things to make it easier for people like you and myself to study. I believe it was Vi um, it, Strong's concordance. took him over 20 years to put that together of his life of time and effort to put every single scripture, every single scripture, every single Greek word, every single Hebrew word in that concordance so that all you have to do is go, oh, the word, um, what? Adoption. Look up and find every place in the Bible where it says adoption. Go back into the Greek and look at it and see all the words of adoption, all the words in Hebrew, and see the the, the intended root meaning of that word. I mean, it took him 20 years to do that. And it only takes you 10 minutes to do that now because of someone's sacrifice that did that. And I think sometimes when we, we don't take advantage of those things, we just sit back and expect God to fill our minds with who he is. We never grow. We never develop. We never, we never go beyond the realms that, we, that God wants to take us. You know, like he says, set my feet upon you know, that, the place beyond borders. We sing that song. Right? Beyond borders. We're trusting the Lord so we can go further than what God has taken us. That's only going to come as you study God's Word. Okay? The more you study God's Word, the more you, you're going to be more uh, assured of the truths of God's Word and of who God is in your life. Praise the Lord. Then is analytical languages. There are these languages in which we, in order for the words in a sentence determines the, the role of each word plays in that sentence. So, in other words, I think I used this exa example before, and I keep hearing people say this all the time about the armor of God. Put on the armor of God. Okay, put on the armor of God. So what everybody does is, right, and you hear preachers on TV all the time, when you get up in the morning, make sure you got the armor of God on, right? Put the helmet on and put the breastplate of righteousness, put all the stuff on. You know, spiritually speaking, put it all on. But when you look at it analytically, the word put is what's called the eros, eros uh, imperative, which is a command to do something once and, and only once. 
So what he's saying is, put it on, keep it on, the armor of God. Don't take it off. But see, in the, in the, in the, just reading it in the English, it's like, okay, put on the armor of God. So I'm going to put it on every day. No, you've got to know the tense of that word and what it was talking about. And, and keep, why should you take the armor of God off? I mean, are we in a battle 24-7? Spiritually? Even when we sleep? Sometimes the devil even attacks when we sleep. Okay, why should we take the armor off when we're sleeping? We should keep the armor on 24-7. So that's why put on, the aura's intent is to keep it on, put it on, leave it on. So, but if you don't understand that and you don't know that, you're going to just think every day I'm going to get up and do, 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 put the armor of God on, you know. And you're going to just do that. No, then you're getting a wrong interpretation of the Bible. Same way with Ephesians. <clears throat> Well, the, they call it the five-fold ministry. It's really a four-fold ministry if you go according to the Greek structure. Now, I don't have a problem if people want to call it five. They can call it five all they want to. I don't, I'm not offended by that. Okay? But if you're looking at it from the, from the study of the Greek and, and, the, and the way the language is and analytically, and it doesn't say five. It's, a, it's, it's four. The pastor-teacher. The pastor-teacher is the same person. It's not two separate people. So, again, if you don't know that and you haven't been taught that, you know, just like uh, you read the Bible and it says, in the hand of God and the eye of God and the ear of God is attentive to your cry and the hand of God is there to reach down and pull you up. Well, those are expressions of God, but God doesn't have a literal hand. He doesn't have a literal ear. He doesn't have a literal eye. He's a spirit. Hello? And now I'm telling you, I've gotten some trouble for that. Okay? It's called the anthropomorphic expression of God. It's, it's used to that... These parts of people, like hand, foot, eye of God, all this, so that you and I can comprehend. And it's only there in a, in a figurative way. It's not there in a literal way. Although we do the literal interpretation, we talked about hyperliteralism also. We talked about that. How people will take hyperliteralism, like what? Well, okay, I'll give you an example. Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Well, if you take that literally, you better, everybody be plucking their eyes out. If your hands offend you, cut it off. Everybody will be cutting their hands off. So there's, there's times where you take the literal, but you take the literal with a metaphorical expression. You don't take it that literal, uh, ultra high literal. So we talked about that. So there's also what's called th synthetic languages, and these are the languages in which the ending of the word determines the role it plays. Sometimes in the Greek, uh, sometimes when you read, you look at a word, uh, 2 Timothy 2.12, I think it is. It says, I suffer not a woman to teach. Okay? So we look at that and say, okay, well, that means a, a woman can't get up and teach. That's not, what the, that's not what it says in the Greek. What it says in the Greek, the didaskalian, E-I-N is the ending on that word teach. So it says, actually, the meaning of that is, I suffer not a woman to be a teacher. And the teacher is not that she can't get up and speak. But, but it's a teacher in uh, setting forth doctrine in the church. Because he's talking to Timothy, who's a pastor in that scripture. Okay, so the ending of the word makes all the difference in the world. And if you don't know that, then you just think, oh, she, can, she can't be, a, she, you know, I suffer not a woman to teach. So she can't get up and teach. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that she cannot be a, a, a teacher, pastor, teacher, as Ephesians was talking about. Because remember, Timothy was a pastor where? Ephesus. Right? He was the pastor of Ephesus. So Paul's having a dialogue with Timothy, who's pastor of, of, of the Ephesus church, and he's telling them, I suffer not a woman to teach. Well, what does that mean? Go back into Ephesians, right? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, the two are one person. So he's saying that a woman can't be a pastor teacher. That's what he's, he's conveying in 1 Timothy 2.12. Okay? So, but if you don't know that ending of that E-I-N, teacher, you wouldn't be able to put the connection back together. You know, it's like a train with, a, you know, with all the connectors. You've got to have all the connectors in place. So there's, that. there's also that. <coughs> then there's what's called literally style. Literary expression, there's figures of speech, there's phrases, there's passages, and there's different books 
uh, that you can go and look through the Bible and see the, how that word is or what, what that meaning is. Uh, one of my favorite is, and I've, I've said this before, I'll say it again, one of the favorites that I have is Revelation 12, chapter 12 in Revelation, where it says, the woman was clothed with the sun and the moon and the stars. And a lot of commentaries today say that the woman is the church. And I say to them, how can you say that? Go back to principle of first mention, and they're forgetting proper biblical interpretation. And when you don't know that, when you don't know these things, what, what ends up happening is you begin to teach error. The sun and the moon and the stars is not, the woman is not the church, it's Israel. Okay. Well, how do you determine that? Principle of first mention. When is the sun, moon, and stars mentioned? In the Bible. Joseph's dream. Joseph in Genesis. He has a dream. And he, he gets this dream and, and he calls his, his dad over and says, Dad, Dad, I had a dream. So what's the dream? He says, I had a dream that the sun and the moon and the stars, they paid obeisance to me. What did the father say? Oh, man, what a great dream. No, he rebuked him. He says, what? Shall I and thy mother and thy brother come and bow down to thee? So he knew the interpretation of the sun, the moon, and the stars. It was Israel. You follow me? So, principle of first mention in Genesis, bring it all the way to Revelation. Sun and moon and stars cannot be anyone else but Israel. The only reason why they make it the church is because they want the church to be in existence after chapter 4 so they can say, see, the church is here on earth during the tribulation to promote their post-tribulation review. So, okay, so you've got to be careful of that. Some of the tools you can be using. Englishman's Greek Concordance. The Englishman's Hebrew and Chaldean Court Concordance. The Greek English Concordance of the New Testament. I'm just giving you a couple of names if you want to. You have it in your book, so you can, you can just look at some of these. I'll just give them out for those who don't have a book. For lexicons, you have the analytical Greek lexicon from Zondervan. You've got the Greek English lexicon from Arnett and, and Gurnich in the University of Chicago, uh, Thayer's Greek English lexicon. Then you have lexical aids, which is expository dictionary of the New Testament. That, that's Vines I told you about earlier. But grammatical insights into New Testament uh, by Clark. You have the New Testament words by Barclay. New Testament word studies. Um, you also have um, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, Kittle. I showed you the picture of it. There's a 10-volume set. I think it's a 10-volume set. And you also have a one complete volume. Um, if you really want to get into this stuff, you can get into that. Okay? Uh, and then there's New, New Testament Greek for Beginners, Practical Grammar of Classical Hebrew, and Figures of Speech Used in the Bible by E.W. Berlinger. Uh, that book is really very, 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 very helpful. Because they use, it goes and explains a lot of the figures of speech and what they mean. And then you have what's called the material culture of things that are necessary to study the material features and expressions of the society in which you lived at that time. So you have, these are all things you have to take. In, you have to understand. Paul was not dressed in a three-piece suit with a with a tie, and you know, and he was looking like a guy today. He wasn't in jeans with cutoffs and you know holes in his jeans and shirt untucked and sleeves uprolled. No, he wasn't. You have to understand the culture in which he lived in when he made certain uh, uh, euphorisms and things like that. You have to understand those things so that you can understand what the scriptures are actually talking about. They have Bible dictionaries. Um, um, Davis Dictionary. They have Bible Dictionaries by Smith. Uh, Unger's Bible Dictionary. I have that one. Unger's a very good dictionary if you want to get one of those. So you have, uh, you have the um, vocabulary gap, the cultural gap, the linguistic gap, rather, the cultural gap, and then you have the geographical gap. The problem is the geographical context of the biblical writers is foreign to many of us today that are reading. How many ever read, I'll give you an example. How many ever read that scripture where Jesus said to Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church? Now, you keep quiet. Okay. I might, have, I might have explained it to you before, but I don't know if I did. But if I did, and you know I did, then you be quiet. What does that mean? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. What do you think it means? 
First of all, why does God, why does hell have gates? It doesn't make any sense. You can't go from one place to another anyway. So why would it have a gate? I knew there was somebody here that heard that. Okay. Well, when Linda and I went to uh, Israel, and we went to Capernaum, we were there, and Jesus was, when Jesus was there, I'm not saying he was there when we were there, but when Jesus was there, let me clarify that. When Jesus was there, okay, he was talking to Peter, right? And as he was talking to Peter, there was a dialogue going on, and then he said to Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We all agree he said that, right? But what we don't know is what he was doing when he said that. And you say, well, Pastor, how can we know what he was doing? Because in Capernaum, there was a place up on a hill where they had uh, built in into the, into the side of the rock caverns where they worshipped pagan, the pagan god Pan, P-A-N. Okay? And they had several other temples that were built there. Okay? And when Jesus was talking to Peter, he said, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. And he pointed to that pagan god, Pan. And he said, in the gates of hell, in other words, false religion, false worship, says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I was, I, when I was standing there, the Holy Spirit brought revelation to my heart and said, do you see how true that scripture is? And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, all of you Christians that are here, aren't you the church? I said, yes, that thing's dead and gone. The worship of Pan in that temple was gone. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And what he's saying is that those false religions will not prevail over the true church. So even as we get up to the, the culmination of the time where the rapture comes, the false religions that's happened, the false church. Let me tell you, there's a false church. There's a false Christian church out there. Okay, And we have to be very careful. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So he says, I, he said, I will build my church. And upon this rock, Peter, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. So that's, what's that? Oh, okay. I thought you had a comment. Praise the Lord. So we have a geographical gap. We don't understand geographically sometimes where the things that have taken place, and we have to understand that. <clears throat> and there's also tools for that so you can understand that. The historical gap, uh, historical gap you know about, the Hebrews and the, the traditions and things like that, it's, it's good to learn those things. There's a book called Manners and Customs of Bible Times. <clears throat> I forget who the author is. I don't know if it was Clark. I'm trying to remember. But um, if you can get a book like that on, on customs, on the things, especially the Jewish wedding, when Jesus talked about going for the bride and the bridegroom comes and all that stuff, there's so much Jewish significance to that, that if you read about the Jewish wedding, how, how the, the, the bridegroom would betroth the bride, then he would go away. Okay, And what he would do is he would go away, the Jewish man would go away, and he'd prepare a place for his bride. Right. He'd build her a house. He'd build a house and a place of abode. And then, you know, that takes time, right? And so he would build a house. And then when the house was complete, he would send, he would send a forerunner before him. And they would walk over wherever, you know, how many miles, two miles, three miles, wherever it was. They would walk over and he'd have a forerunner, someone before him, an announcer. Okay. Almost like the trump of God, the announcer before the event. And he said he would get to the he would get to the bride to the bridegroom's location where the house is, and the announcer would, would yell out, The bridegroom cometh, the bridegroom cometh. And the bride would would be ready. She'd be ready. She wouldn't have to get ready, she'd be ready. For in an hour that you think not. 
the bridegroom will come. So there's a so when you talk to a Hebrew, you talk to a Jewish person, they know that story from from everyday life. They they do that. Every, so it has so much depth and meaning to them when Jesus said those words. You know, be ready for now. When you think not, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And they're like, wow. So you put all of that together. So so it's good to have that manners and customs to understand the different things that go go on in the Bible. Amen. Praise God. Then is the then there's also the political background of the time, who was in charge, who was, who was over Israel, who had conquered Israel. You know, what was the situation like? Were they in bondage? Well, when you read the Old Testament, was it the Assyrian bondage? Was it the Babylonian bondage? Was it the Alexandrian bondage that they were in when, when they started to take over and flow into the New Testament time of the Greeks being in power? So you, all these things in, you have to take into consideration because... That's where you can begin to know what prophet spoke when. Isaiah spoke when. Jeremiah spoke when. When did Zechariah come in? When did the building of the temple? You begin to understand all of the time frames and elements because sometimes you can take that out of, out of the chronological order that it belongs in and you're going to miss up and think, oh, wait a minute. I thought he built it over here and now it's saying it's built over there. No, it's talking about two different things. So you have to understand that. Then is the economic background. Understanding the economic background helps you to understand sometimes the sacrifices of people when they gave. When you understand the economic background of how it was that many people were poor. They didn't have a lot. And they were Christians. They didn't have a lot. So being a Christian doesn't mean that God's going to give you prosperity. I mean, God wants you to prosper, okay, and be blessed, but that's not the main objective of being a Christian. That's why when the woman came and Jesus said, look at this woman. And she came and she cast two mites. That was pennies. That's all she had. But there were people that came in and gave out of their abundance, okay? And what did Jesus say? He said, who gave more? Who gave more? Why? Because the two mites was all she had. In other words, she was willing to die of starvation. That's all she had. She had no more money. Us, what we do is we say, okay, uh, I've got $10, so uh, $2 for Jesus, or maybe 50 cents for Jesus, and nine fifty for me, because i got to eat. <clears throat> Come on. Because the culture we live in. <clears throat> but back then, they knew what it was to sacrificially give. That's why Jesus said, Give and it shall be given back unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. Because they freely gave everything they had. That's why he said to me, If any man comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's why when he went to the fisherman and he took the fisherman and he said, Hey, follow me. He didn't say, they didn't say, okay, okay, guys, let's put the boat on wheels and let's go. They didn't take their fishing industry with them. They left their fishing industry. They were willing to sacrifice anything and everything it was to follow the master. What about today? Is it, are we serving the same Jesus? Are we walking with the same Jesus? Are we, are we following the same Jesus? Then why is not the commitment to follow Jesus the same as it should be in the Bible times. What's the difference? And see, when you start thinking like that, and you start sitting and contemplating and having a quiet time with God and contemplating these things, it begins to motivate you to be serving God even more. Because believe me, trust me, the commitment level that we have a lot in Christianity today is, is way down here from where God wants it to be. And so just think about it. if we all had, if we all sold out to God 100% what God could do through our lives. I mean 100% serve, serving God. Think about what he could do with our lives. But we get caught and entangled with all these things. That's why he says, be not entangled with the yoke of bondage. Don't be entangled with the things of this world. Don't let this world get you all tangled up where you can't even come to church anymore because you're doing so many other different things. Well, I didn't get no amens, brother. 
This is a, this is a very lonely place tonight. <clears throat> so let, let me just kind of go over just a little bit. Um, the tools. You got you can study archaeology in Bible history. You can study a Bible history itself, Old Testament Bible history. Um, one of the nice books, but it's kind of deep a little bit. You've got to kind of read it, is um, Bible History of the Old Testament by Alfred Rudersheim. Have that book. It's very good. It's a nice book. And also Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Rudersheim. He's a Jewish believer who wrote that Bible. And I'm telling you, that gives you a lot of insight. I don't know if it was one of his books, uh, but uh, or it was another uh, Jewish rabbi book that I read a long time ago. I forget where, where I read it. But I can't always remember everything I read even though some people think I'm a walking encyclopedia and I'm not. They always ask me questions about things and definitions, and I'm like, what do you think I am, a walking Bible dictionary or something? So look it up. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of times I may know the answer, but I want to I try to incite the person to go and look it up themselves so they can have some study time. But um, I, I, I read, the, read it somewhere. Uh, in the book of, um, I think it's in the book of is it Matthew, which says, no, no, it's in Luke, I'm sorry, it's in Luke. But Jesus said, you probably read this a thousand times, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he's anointed me to preach the good news, right? Set the captives free, blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't know the whole scripture by verbatim. But you know the scripture, right? And then it says, and then he took the, the scrolls, he was in the synagogue, he took the scrolls, he, he put them away, and he sat down. And they were all amazed. Do you know what happened there? Uh, Tom, I think you do. No? Oh, you had that little look in you, know, like, okay. But do you know do you know the story of that? Well, when he read the scripture, right, it says he read the scripture, and he, he put the scrolls down, and he sat down. <clears throat> in the Jewish synagogue, they have a chair. And that chair is specifically reserved for the Messiah only. So when if he was reading about the Spirit of the Lord being upon him and all that, that was a, that was a messianic scripture. And then he closed the book and he sat down. He sat in that chair, and they were all astonished when they seen him sit in that chair. But see, but but not knowing that doesn't bring a depthness to that, and and and, and that's so exciting. But it, it took took digging into studying that find that out and it was like wow god that is so amazing you know and and the other thing is when we were uh, when we were in Capernaum too is they had a temple there okay <clears throat> and when Jesus went to that temple he taught there's a specific seat in this temple in Capernaum remember when and Jesus went to that temple taught. It's right he taught now. there's a specific right seat there in the in this that temple, that means it's all burn them down and remember you know, and stuff like the things they could. Read when Jesus went to that temple, it's right taught. Just think of that for one moment. There's a specific like seat in, the in this, this temple. That means it's all burn them down and remember and stuff like the things they could. When Jesus went to that temple, right taught. Just think for that you read it. There's a specific seat in this temple. That means it's all burn them down and remember when you're there and stuff like the things they could. When Jesus went to that temple, right taught. Just think for that you read it. There's a specific seat in this temple. That means it's all burn them down and remember when Jesus went to that temple, right taught. Just think for that you read it. There's a specific seat in this temple. That means it's all burn them down and remember when you're there and stuff like the things they could. Went to that temple, he taught. That you read it. There's a specific seat in this temple. That means it's all burn them down. And remember, when they could. When Jesus went to that temple, he taught. That you read it. There's a specific seat in this temple. That means it's all burn them down. And remember, when they could. When Jesus went to that temple, he taught. That you read it. There's a specific seat in this temple. That means it's all burn them down. And remember, when they could. When Jesus went to that temple, he taught. When Jesus went to that temple, he taught. That you read it is a specific seat. So on in the temple, that means all burn them down. And remember, when Jesus went to that temple, he taught. That you read it is a specific seat. So on in the temple, that means all burn them down. And remember, when Jesus went to that temple, he taught. That you read it is a specific seat. 
So, in the temple, it all burned up. Down, remember? Yeah, because when Jesus went to that temple, he taught. So, in the temple, it all burned up. Down, remember? Yeah, because when Jesus went to that temple, he taught. So, in the temple, it all burned up. Down, remember? Yeah, because when Jesus went to that temple, he taught. So, in the temple, it all burned up. Down,
why did he them how to apply it? Both had all the So God said, no, Adam, that's not good enough. So he killed an animal, shed the blood, took the skin of that animal and covered them. So they understood that the forgiveness of their sin was through the shedding of blood. They taught that to, the, to, to, Abel, to Abel. They taught that to Cain. But Cain says, I'll go to God my way. I don't have to go through sacrifice of animals. He could have took some of his fruit, went to his brother and said, look, I'll give you two baskets of fruit for an animal sacrifice. He could have done that. And he would have had an animal too, and he could have sacrificed the animal the way that God intended. But that shows us that there are people that want to come to God their way, not the way that God had intended for them to come. They want to serve God their way, and God either has to accept it or it's too bad. But what did God say? Hey, he says, why, why are you angry, Cain? Sin lieth at the door. In other words, you're doing it your own way. You're trying to come to me through your works, and I've already provided the way through a shed blood. You can't come any other way. Sorry. Unless we know those things, unless we... We sit before God, like you said. Be led by the Spirit of God. Let the, bring the Holy Spirit into your Bible study. Don't just study it from a scholastic point of view. Don't just look at it from an intellectual point of view. Don't just look at it from a bunch of information you're going to store in your, in your brains. And it goes nowhere, but just in factual, in factual information. No, you don't want just factual information. A computer can spat, spit out factual information and have no emotion tied to it whatsoever. You want it to become a part of you so that when you're in time of trouble, the Holy Ghost can bring those things up. And, you, know, you know, when you sing a song, don't let it just be a song. Today there's so much fluff songs, I'm telling you, they have no substance whatsoever. But you sing a song. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. But how do you, how do you know his, how his, great is his faithfulness? Because you, as you sing that song, your thoughts go to your life and how God has been so faithful to you. How he's been a father to you. How he has provided for you. And out of that gratitude from your innermost being comes great is. Thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies. You get new mercies every day? You equate that with experiential knowledge of your relationship with God. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. And when you're in a situation, where you, can, you have only one place to go to God and you can't trust any. There's nobody, no else, nowhere else to go. Guess what? Great is thy faithfulness. When he comes back riding on the white horse, what does it say on the side? Faithful and true. Amen. Come on, somebody. So let's close with that, okay? So let the revelation of God's word bring new, refreshed desire to get into the Word, not as an as a, uh, intellectual exercise, but get into the Word so that you can know the author of this Word. And the better you know the author, the Bible says, they that know their God, they will do exploits. 
So when you know your God, not the God that people say he is and they think he is, and all these misconceptions about God and the things that are happening in the world today and how they're twisting the very nature of God by, by even changing their own identities, like the Bible says, they hold the, they hold the righteousness of God in unrighteousness. So God will send them strong delusion that they will believe a lie. I'm sorry, I won't believe a lie. Not going to. People joke about things like that. I'm not joking about those things. We're living in the last days and Jesus is coming soon. We've got to be ready. We've got to tell people about Jesus. It's great to jump and shout and feel the Holy Ghost coming on. But coming on for what? Jump and shout? Or is the Holy Ghost coming on to convict us that we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing with evangelism? Because God sent the Holy Ghost, not so we could jump and shout, to bring the world under conviction of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That's why the Holy Ghost was sent. Come on, somebody. I'm not getting, I, I'm telling you, I'm getting very lonely up here. That's why he sent the Holy Ghost, was to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. But we always think that he's going to send the Holy Ghost so we can have fun. Hey, we're going to have fun the Holy Ghost. Hey, yeah. Uh. Okay, that's good. We can do that. We can grab like we did. Sing. You know, I feel the Holy Ghost coming on. I feel the, you know, that's great. But for what? Just to touch us for that five, ten minutes, then go home and be the same? Let me tell you something. When God touches you, you can't be the same. Think about this, the eternal one, the all-sufficient one, the all-knowing one, the all-powerful one, the all-creative one touches you. How can you be the same? When you go into his manifest presence, how can you be the same? So when you come out, you should be different, right? Amen. You should be closer to God. But you don't understand, Pastor. I've been going through the desert. I've been going through a dry time. I've been going through a time I don't feel God. Yeah, thank God for it. Huh? Yeah, thank God for it, because that's what's making you hungry and thirsty for more. Don't believe these false prophets out there that are telling you don't, don't be negative. You need to have those dry experiences. You need to go through the desert sometimes like you feel like your mouth is full of sand and you're not feeling God at all and you're not, you don't understand God, where are you, man? I, I've been praying, I've been singing, I don't feel no anointing, I don't feel nothing. Let me tell you something. Sometimes you need to just learn to walk by faith and not by sight, hallelujah. You got to get up there even when you don't feel like getting up there. Hallelujah. Sometimes some people say, Oh, Pastor, I don't feel like singing today. Oh, too bad. Get up there and sing. Sometimes I don't feel like preaching. Sometimes I don't feel like coming to Bible study. But I have to come and, and, and do, my, do what God wants me to do. Amen. Because you, you don't go by sight. You go by faith. You grow in Christ and grow in the knowledge of Him. And get excited about God. I mean, we get excited, man, watching a football game. We get excited watching a baseball game or a soccer game, right? You, if your team is, is behind and all of a sudden, you know, there's like five minutes left in the game and your team is running down a thing and you're getting ready and he's getting, and then he's coming along and he's going, it's goal, goal, go! and you're jumping up, goal, goal. Go! <laughs> right, George? I can see you. that's what happens with you, right? <laughs> Come on, Right? Uh, you know, the last second your team comes back and wins the game. You just sit there? Oh, that was good. No. You're like, oh, all right, yeah. Get excited. Did I tell you, get in the game of Jesus. Get in the game, you'll, be, you'll get excited. To be a part of that game. Be a part of the team with Jesus. Get excited. Read, read God's word once again. Amen? Father, thank you for your word. We pray, God, that you will bless us, Lord, that you will help us, strengthen us, encourage us, Lord, to read your word and to, Father, rightly divide it. 
Teach us how to do that. Give us the instruments we need. Give us the tools we need. We thank you and we praise you tonight. Bless those who are listening tonight. Father, I pray, God, that you will bless them in Maine. You will bless them in, in India. That you will bless them in Fall River. God, I pray that you just bless them tonight uh, exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, God bless you tonight. Amen.